talk is entitled molecular testing landscape in lung cancer and as uh, dr choudhry mentioned the last decade or so has been very exciting uh, and hopefully i can go over some of the developments uh, over the past decade just few disclosures um, i have received consulting fees from different companies in the last year i will mention foundation one platform which is a ngs platform owned by roche there are other many commercial ngs platforms uh, for use i have been paid an honorarium to get the stock i will mention some drugs that may not be approved uh, for a particular tumor type uh, in bangladesh so my purpose is not to endorse or encourage use of uh, off label use of any particular drugs i'm here to just discuss uh, lung cancer and molecular testing in lung cancer my talk is going to be divided in uh, eight sections uh, i know and i believe there are some medical students joining us as well so i will start by a brief description of description of cancer uh, a bit about epidemiology and overview of lung cancer and what has changed in the past decade or so and then we will get to the meat of the talk which is genetics and evolution of uh, genetic testing in cancer and as well as molecular characterization of lung cancer um we will discuss briefly what is the difference between sequential uh, biomarker testing versus comprehensive biomarker testing and what are the benefits of uh, uh, either uh, what is the value of liquid biopsy in in non small cell lung cancer and then i have a few interesting cases uh, of my own to discuss uh, with my colleagues so we know um probably since the 60s that cancer is the disease of the genome and genome can be defined as the complete set of genes or genetic material present in a cell or organism and as we go back to high school biology we know that all of us are made up of cells and cell has a nucleus which contains chromosomes which contains the genetic material and insult to the genetic material whether by carcinogens viruses or infections radiations or just mistakes in dna copying when our cells divide can lead to alterations in genetic material and uh, proteins which eventually will lead to cancer and what is the function of the genome uh, in a sense putting it simply is to create protein um, we know that dna gets transcribed into mrna which carries the code into the cytoplasm of the cell and then with the ribosome machinery and trna um, the rna is transcribed into amino acids and this growing chain of amino acids will eventually form proteins uh, based on the sequence of the amino acid so the central dogma of molecular biology is that dna is transcribed into rna and then rna is spliced um uh into a mature rna which is eventually translated in the cytoplasm to protein and when these genes especially genes involved in cellular division are altered it leads to uh, altered proteins and this lead to altered pathways in the cell uh, these pathways that are involved in growth division uh, and apoptosis eventually leading to uncontrolled growth uh, or what is called cancer so if we can understand the specific alterations in these cancer cells we can hopefully block them with targeted therapies instead of using chemotherapy and radiation and what is fascinating is that um even though we have a lot of genetic material probably only 20 we know of only 22000 genes responsible for life as we know it and amongst these 22000 genes only a few hundred are so far known to be involved in cancer genesis and amongst these few hundred cancer genes there are only few that have actionable mutations now we are hoping of course with ongoing research that we will find um, more actionable Uh, mutations in genes involved in these uh, cancer formation so i would label this as the revolution of cancer care uh, cancer care as we all know is becoming more personalized is moving towards a more individualized treatment plan for every patient for example on the left this was probably the way lung cancer was treated when i was a medical student everyone was given a platinum based tablet chemotherapy some patients benefited some didn't benefit at all but all got toxicity so not a very scientific way of treating uh, a, such a deadly disease uh, subsequently with the identification of molecular alterations such as the egfr mutation which i shall uh, touch upon later as well we developed targeted therapies based on this biomarker and this benefited 
uh, a significant proportion of patients, although not all. And as we move forward in, into today and, and tomorrow, we find more and more uh, alterations, more and more actionable mutations, sometimes more than one together in the same cancer. And we are now going into era of combination therapies to get the cancer under control. So advances in cancer biology is driving a future where cancer is truly becoming more personalized. One patient, one tumor profile, but more options. So switching gears to epidemiology of lung cancer, uh, some of this you guys already know, this is a deadly disease. Unfortunately, only a small portion of lung cancer is still diagnosed at an early stage where the tumor can be treated with surgical resection. Most often we find the cancer in advanced stage. Globally in 2018, there were estimated to be 2.1 million cases of lung cancer worldwide, out of which 1.8 million patients actually passed away, um, thereby underlying how deadly this cancer is. Um, it continues to be the most commonly diagnosed cancer for both sexes. I don't have the demographics and the data for Bangladesh, but in Singapore, at least, uh, lung cancer is in the top three cancers for both men and women. The other um, concerning aspect is the project projected cost of lung cancer care, which is uh, increasing every year, especially with the availability of, of um, new drugs and estimated to be more than $15 billion, at least in the US. And lung cancer has caused more deaths in 2017 than breast, prostate, brain, and colorectal cancers combined, which is very concerning. But not all is hopeless. Um, there is a silver lining, declines in smoking and improvements in early detection and treatment, as well as, as I said, new drugs have resulted in a continuous decline in the cancer mortality. In fact, a recent paper showed that in the past decade, um, there has been the largest single-year drop in overall cancer-related lung cancer-related mortality of 2.2% from 2016 to 2017. So this is uh, very good news indeed. Now, we've known for, for almost three decades now that there are different histological types of lung cancer. And more recently, there are different molecular subtypes of lung cancer, which I will discuss in more detail as I go on in my talk. Today, pathologists are required to categorize lung cancer at least into adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma because the same drugs that are used to treat adenocarcinoma may be inappropriate for squamous cell cancer, such as bevacizumab or avastin. 85% of all lung cancer subtypes are uh, come under non-small cell lung cancer, uh, within which there are more groups such as large cell, squamous cell, and adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma continues to be the most common subtype of non-small cell lung cancer. Um, small cell lung cancer, which is a very aggressive disease, uh, very intimately associated with a history of smoking, fortunately accounts for only 15% of all lung cancers. But this um, uh, talk today will primarily focus on non-small cell lung cancer. So as I mentioned, um, today our pathologist um, um, subtype uh, uh, lung cancer into non-small cell or small cell, and then further use immunohistochemical stains, which is uh, IHC, uh, to distinguish non-small cell lung cancer into either lung adenocarcinoma, which is defined by positive staining with napsin and TTF1, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, which is usually positive for P40, P63, CK5, and 6, neuroendocrine or small cell lung cancer, which is um, uh, uh, Shows which shows sorry positive staining for CD56, chromogranin, synaptophysin, uh, and then rarely uh, malignant mesothelioma or metastatic carcinoma, which is cancer that is spread to the lung from another organ. As I mentioned, there has been a decline in mortality from lung cancer, primarily because of better detection, better access to services, better surgical treatments, as well as better cancer treatment options for advanced cancer. If you go back to the 1920s and 30s, we only have radiation therapy to treat lung cancer. From 1940 to now, we've had chemotherapy. Um, not a lot of progress um, over the past two decades with chemotherapy. 1998, we had the first targeted therapy approved, and in 2010, the first immunotherapy approved. And now we are commonly using personalized combination therapies such as chemotherapy and immunotherapy, and even um, a combined targeted therapy. So we can see, as I've 
uh, highlighted below from a one drug fits all treatment approach based on just histology. Now we are in a personalized treatment based on comprehensive knowledge of the type of patients. Sorry, there's a little bit of noise in the background. So I will move to the next uh, portion of my talk, which is genetics and evolution of genetic testing in cancer. So you can't talk about genetics without going back to 1953 with the discovery of DNA. Um, this is uh, attributed to Francis Crick and James Wonston, uh, who announced in, uh, on February 28, 1953, that they had discovered the secret of life. They basically elucidated the DNA function and how genetic information was stored by the DNA, and they received a Nobel Prize for this. And subsequently, genetic testing has evolved very quickly. I've just highlighted some important events in the past 30 years, 30 to 40 years, I should say. 1977 was the development of DNA sequencing technique by Fred Sanger, for which he developed, uh, sorry, for which he was given the Nobel Prize for medicine. And this is still utilized in certain laboratories. In 1983 was the invention of PCR. In 2001, the first draft of Human Genome Project was released. In 2005, we had the development of next generation sequencing, which is used till today. So the Human Genome Project, which was started in 1990, both in the public and private sector in the US. Sorry. Uh, cost uh, $3 billion and took 15 years. Um, three billion bases were sequenced using Sanger sequencing, which was a very slow, laborious, and painful process. And it's interesting if you compare Moore's law and genome sequencing. Moore's law is a cost of computing drops by a factor of two every year or so. And that's uh, described by this curve here. But if you compare it to next-gen sequencing, we see, uh, sorry, uh, when you compare that, compare that to sequencing on the genome, we see that in 2007, with the advent of next-gen sequencing, the cost of uh, genome sequencing, sequencing dropped rapidly from the billions of dollars used in the Human Genome Project to a few thousand dollars which are required today. So what do you do with a thousand dollar genome? It's really a very exciting uh, time. Uh, for the medical students to understand the stock better, I think it's important to go back to the basics to understand the type of DNA alterations that can occur in a cell. So this is a normal chromosome, and this is one gene in the chromosome shown by the green band. Substitutions means that this particular gene is, is replaced by another gene leading to an altered gene product. Whereas insertions and deletions basically refer to insertion of a new genetic product or a new gene, uh, sorry, insertion of new gene material into this uh, existing gene or deletion of a segment of this gene, both uh, leading to altered protein synthesis. You can also have copy number alterations where the gene can be, um, uh, can multiply and have more copies, more or less. And you can always also have um, rearrangements where the genetic material is exchanged between chromosome uh, leading to altered gene, uh, altered proteins. A uh, classic example is Philadelphia chromosome. Now, it's also interesting to see the evolution of molecular testing, which I briefly discussed previously. So as you've seen, as the, evolution, the molecular profiling methodology has evolved, uh, the impact on clinical management has improved from a single gene or, or simple tests that I call category one tests that include FISH, IHC, PCR, to more specialized or, or second category tests such as Sanger sequencing and hotspot testing, to hybrid capture and whole genome sequencing, uh, which are category three tests. Now, interestingly, the curve does drop, meaning you are having less impact on clinical management. But the hope is that with uh, more access to next-gen sequencing techniques and tests, lower costs, uh, more patients will benefit, and this will lead to uh, more, uh, as I said, personalized medicine approach in uh, non-small cell lung cancer. So these conventional diagnostic tests, which are still used even in Singapore in mo most labs, are important, uh, but they are limited. They are limited by their design. Here is a cartoon that shows 
uh, DNA mo uh, molecule with, with a particular gene here, if you call it gene one. And this can be detected by fish, uh, SISH, PCR, or even by uh, next-gen sequencing. And when amplified, it can be further uh, interrogated with PCR or RNA sequencing. The protein product of this anomalous gene can be detected by IHC, but you are missing most of the other um, uh, genes or DNA sequence um, by using these tests. So category one tests, like I mentioned, a routine single marker molecular test such as IHC, PCR, and FISH that have been used for decades and still continue to play an uh, important role in cancer diagnosis, but can lead to um, uh, missing other mutations uh, in other sections of the gene which may be relevant to the patient's uh, treatment. Category two or hotspot NGS panels, which are quite popular now, identify pre-specified mutations occurring in very limited areas of genes of interest. And they fail to detect, again, all classes of genomic uh, alterations as highlighted in this uh, cartoon. Finally, comprehensive genomic profiling, approaching uh, testing of all clinically relevant cancer genes for all classes of alterations, whether insertions, deletions, copy number variations, substitutions, or translocations. So clearly, comprehensive genomic profiling gives us a lot of information. And we will talk a little more about this as we go forward in the talk. Um, I've been using this term a lot, next generation sequencing. What does it really mean? Uh, none of, I, I know there are a few pathologists um, uh, listening to this talk. I'm not a pathologist, but I think basic knowledge is important. Next gen sequencing is basically parallel sequencing of millions of short DNA fragments in a single reaction. So the genetic material is um, inserted into this chip. Um, the DNA binds to the surface, it's amplified, and then uh, millions of, of um, short DNA fragments are sequenced. Uh, the alignment of reads uh, is to a reference genome, and this is usually a pretty deep read coverage to identify variants. So to compare hotspot panels to CGP or comprehensive genomic profiling, if this is an example of a segment of a gene, uh, the blue color uh, areas are the hotspots. So hotspot panels are designed just to pick up mutations, or alteration in these uh, blue colored uh, uh, genes or gene uh, uh, segments. Whereas comprehensive genomic profiling will look at all coding regions of selected genes in its entirety. So you don't end up missing uh, genes which, which, may, uh, which may be altered and missed by a hotspot panel because it only looks at uh, certain areas of interest. Um, just reading the, the gene is not enough. Uh, after the NGS is done, the post-analytical analysis of bioinformatics is also extremely important because you may find many variants uh, in the particular gene that you sequence, but we want to remove the common variants. We want to focus on the cancer-driven variants. Out of that, we want to choose the deleterious variants and, in fact, the causal variants because you may find a lot of cancer-driven variants, but you may not be able to associate uh, cancer genesis with these variants, and these may not be actionable. So again, if you compare uh, hotspot testing to CGP, in addition to detection of all genomic alterations, which hotspot testing can't do, we also um, um, can test for microsatellite instability and tumor mutational burden, uh, which my colleague referred to PREFOR. Uh, both of these take around the same time. The cost is also coming uh, to be very similar now, uh, and the information is becoming uh, more and more understandable for, understandable for busy clinicians like myself. And why is this? What has this led to? Uh, it's really led to a revolution or evolution in oncology where we are now using more and more genomic-driven therapies for cancer thanks to availability of this kind of information. And just some highlights uh, since 2010, uh, 2009, I would say, when uh, EGFR mutation testing became standard, at least here in Singapore, with the availability of TKIs. Um, ALK testing 2010, BRAF testing in 2011, uh, ROS1 red fusion testing 2012, and the list goes on and on uh, till today. Now let's shift our focus to lung cancer. We've spoken about cancer genetics, testing of uh, alterations in cancer, different 
methodologies, how they have evolved, what are the benefits of one versus the other. But how this is all, how does this all relate to lung cancer? Uh, if you see in 2004, um, the genomic landscape for lung cancer was limited to KRAS, EJFR, and unknown. So we knew that there are some uh, lung cancers, especially those uh, in patients who are heavy smokers that may be associated with KRAS gene mutations. And a small subset, in, especially in Asia, had uh, alteration in the EJFR gene. But other than that, we didn't know much. And just in a decade, thanks to the availability of these new genetic uh, sequencing and, and um, uh, testing techniques uh, availability, uh, we found that uh, more than 65% of, of lung cancer specimens uh, uh, showed uh, or could uh, have a driver mutation. Um, this is data from the West where 17% of the samples had EJFR mutation driven cancers, 25% had KRAS and small proportion had uh, ALK, HER2, BRAF, PIK3 kinase, MET amplification, NRAS and MEK1. But still in about 35%, we could not find a driver mutation. But again, with further refinement of uh, molecular techniques and, and NGS, now we find this number has dropped down to 12%. We are finding even more mutations that can drive cancer, such as P10 loss, TSC1, uh, BRCA, ERBB2, uh, red fusion, uh, cyclic dependent kinase, and so on and so forth. So really now we understand lung cancer is not one disease. It's a very molecularly heterogeneous disease, and it's implicit for us as clinicians to find out which category of lung cancer the patient has so that we can give a personalized treatment to the patient for maximal benefit. Uh, this is just one study that, that looked at all the genomically driven and drugs that were available for the treatment of lung cancer, in which 36% uh, of the time we did not find a driver mutation, but for all the rest of the mutations, there were multiple drugs either already available commercially, which are highlighted in black, or under investigation, which are highlighted in yellow. So you can see what a huge list of drugs, targeted drugs, just for the treatment of lung cancer. Really a very exciting phase. Makes it very difficult for oncologists like us to keep track, uh, but very good for our patients. And if you look at, there is still another small category in the in the uh, the group that have no actionable driver mutation, where we, where we may find low frequency alterations such as AKT, HRAS, BRCA, uh, et cetera, where drugs are again in development and quite uh, likely in the near future, this part of the pie chart will also have drugs that can be used to treat our patients. So what is the sequential versus comprehensive biomarker testing? What does that mean? And what are the pros and cons of each approach? Sequential biomarker testing. So essentially you have a patient with a, a lesion in the lung uh, or multiple lesions suggestive of lung cancer. Patient will undergo a diagnostic biopsy because the biopsy is still gold standard to make the diagnosis of lung cancer. Let's say approximately eight or 10 slides are produced from the biopsy specimen. Three or four slides are used just for HNE staining and ISC staining to determine whether this is a non-small cell lung cancer or a small cell lung cancer. And then if it's a non-small cell lung cancer, whether it's an adenocarcinoma, a large cell or squamous cell carcinoma. Once this has been established, then single uh, uh, biomarker testing can be done starting with the EGFR, then ALK, then ROS, then BRAF, then PDL1. So this is still done in some institutions in Singapore. EGFR mutation uh, positive lung adenocarcinoma is quite common here. 50 to 60% of all adenocarcinomas are driven by EGFR. So if we have um, uh, resources, we don't have, uh, patient does not have the ability to afford a um, comprehensive genomic profiling, we will start with a single biomarker test for EGFR because half of the time is positive. Now, this takes up another additional few slides. Now, if this is negative, then we again test sequentially for or one by one for ALK, ROS, BRAF, and PDL1. 
The problem with this approach is that um, you use up a lot of slides, a lot of tissue, and sometimes not enough tissue is left. So you may end up doing only EJFR, and suddenly you don't have any tissue left to do other biomarkers. And this is could be possibly uh, to the detriment of the patient's um, clinical management. Rebiopsy obviously is not feasible. No person would raise their hand to get biopsy done again. Uh, so uh, sometimes in this situation, liquid biopsy will be used can be useful, which I will discuss a bit more in the next few slides. Um, comprehensive genomic profiling, on the other hand, uh, just uses one sample and looks for uh, all potential alterations in cancer-causing genes. In addition to that, uh, because it's a one test to look for all alterations, it uses less tissue. It also seems to be more sensitive, at least highlighted by some of these papers uh, that I'm going to discuss. Um, on the left, uh, this paper published uh, about um, six, seven years ago in the oncologist that showed that 35% of ALK positive uh, lung cancer was missed by fish testing. And the paper on the right um, that was published in uh, AACR that showed that 17% of EJFR cases were missed by hotspot. And then this uh, experience from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in the U.S., um, very interesting study where they took 31 lung adenocarcinoma specimens with available tissue, uh, and these were labeled as uh, no evidence of genomic alteration by extensive focused non-NGS testing, uh, so either single, market single biomarker testing or hotspot testing. And when uh, NGS panel, such as Foundation One, was used uh, to interrogate these specimens, uh, clinically relevant genomic alteration was seen in 65% of the so-called pan-negative lung adenocarcinoma specimens. So this is uh, really uh, too high a number to miss uh, because these patients would benefit from uh, genomically um, uh, driven uh, therapy. Just to show that uh, uh, comprehensive genomic profiling is a more sensitive and more uh, accurate way of looking for genomic alteration. And this is also highlighted by NCSIN guidelines and other international um, uh, accepted lung uh, cancer guidelines saying that um, broader molecular profiling is strongly recommended to identify uh, genomic alterations as well as rare driver mutations for which effective drugs may already be available. Um, and also in, in big centers to counsel patients regarding availability of clinical trials. Uh, the other interesting aspect of these uh, NGS panels uh, is that uh, they may be helpful in also um, choosing patients for immunotherapy. Uh, we know that um, PDL1 expression is uh, a commonly used biomarker for predicting response to PDL1 inhibition or, or immunotherapy. Um, but PDL1 expression is associated, um, sorry, this association is not absolute. We also know from multiple trials now that almost 8% of lung cancer patients with negative PDL1 staining may still respond to, to pembrolizumab or other immunotherapy drugs. And assay performance, interpretation, PDL1 expression, heterogeneity. Uh, this may limit the sensitivity and specificity of PDL1. So we want additional predictive tools to better enrich the population of patients who may respond to immunotherapy. And this is where comprehensive genomic profiling uh, comes in and is very helpful because it can estimate tumor mutational burden. And this may be associated with response to immunotherapy. I have an interesting case towards the end of my talk, uh, which will highlight this particular uh, benefit of uh, comprehensive genomic profiling. We also know based on the Keynote 158 trial that pembrolizumab was approved as monotherapy for high TMB solid tumors with no satisfactory alternative uh, approximately two years ago. And if you use both PDL1 as well as TMB together, and if both are positive, we have the highest uh, chance of benefit from immunotherapy. So I feel that comprehensive genomic profiling, in addition to telling us about molecular alteration, also gives us information about tumor mutational burden, which is a good predictive biomarker for immunotherapy. So to summarize, standard molecular tests such as immunohistochemistry, FISH, um, uh, complement comprehensive genomic profiling very effectively. 
immunohistochemistry is still very important to accurately diagnose non-small cell lung cancer, to determine the subtype of lung cancer, as well as sometimes to uh, assess expression of predictive biomarkers such as PDL1. However, comprehensive genetic profiling can detect several biomarkers and genomic signatures at once. So with one sample, you don't have to worry about exhaustion of tissue samples um, and it saves time. So I think both of these are important and they should probably be used um, in a complementary fashion. Let's switch gears to liquid biopsy, another very uh, commonly used term. Patients seem to be quite aware of liquid biopsy what it means, how it is beneficial for our patients with advanced lung cancer. Uh, so while tissue-based genetic testing continues to rem remain the standard of care, and I would argue the gold standard, um, because it is quite sensitive for certain alteration, it does have some limitations as well. For example, just doing a biopsy is painful, can be difficult, is invasive um, and expensive. And it may not capture tumor heterogeneity. This is a, a recently dif discovered phenomena, which I will touch on a little more in the subsequent slides. And as I mentioned before, that uh, after doing uh, initial HNE staining and ISC staining, you may just not have enough tissue left um, to do uh, a comprehensive genomic profiling, whereas a blood test is uh, always easily available. And that's where the liquid biopsy uh, is very beneficial. The cost of liquid biopsy also has been coming down. As I said, it's quite easy to collect a sample. The tubes uh, now are developed for preservation of the DNA in the blood sample. It may capture tumor heterogeneity, which I will uh, expand on further in the next few slides. Uh, if you use a good lab, uh, the results are robust, highly specific. Uh, in addition to that, in addition to identifying uh, initial genomic alterations, it can also be used to monitor disease progression and recurrence because you can do a blood sample on many uh, time points in the same patient. So it can enable timely personalized treatment decision by shortening time to results. This is just a paper that I was involved in. We published uh, in the lung cancer about uh, three years ago. Uh, so what we did was we took uh, 50 plasma samples in patients with newly diagnosed advanced non cell lung cancer um, that were, sorry, either newly diagnosed or resistant to first-line TKI. And we subjected them to a, a deep um, sequencing on a seven-gene panel liquid biopsy. And if we had uh, tissue samples, we tried to match the results. We found that uh, at least one alteration in t uh, c um, CT DNA was detected in 44 out of 50 patients. So 88% of this sample set had at least one DNA alteration. Uh, at least in, in Singapore, uh, where I practice in this uh, uh, data set, EJFR was the most frequently mutated gene um, at least 50% of these patients had one actionable genetic alteration. That's huge. So 50% of patients we could use targeted therapy for. And we also found a high concordance rate with tissue biopsy, like many other authors and studies have shown. Um, we could also detect T790 on progression um, uh, with a concordance rate of 92% uh, of patients. So liquid biopsy has clearly shown its value in multiple studies and now is readily available. Uh, so it seems to have a few advantages over tissue biopsy and tissue NGS testing. So one, uh, screening of asymptomatic individuals. Now, this is um, ongoing. There are a lot of um, uh, panels that are in development and research uh, to look at uh, CT, CT DNA for, for diagnosing asymptomatic individuals. So much more effective, yeah. more sensitive, and specific way of detecting um, early disease as compared to cancer markers, which are, which are obviously not very reliable. Um, oh, it can be used. Niacin, niacin. It can be used in combination with tissue biopsy when complementary information is needed. It can be used mm. instead uh, of tissue biopsy where biopsy. Sorry, someone was talking. In uh, uh, if uh, tissue biopsy is yeah. inaccessible, uh, or too invasive. That's another area where liquid biopsy is useful. And I said, as I had mentioned before, this is a more exciting uh, development of using liquid biopsy for surveillance and monitoring. So you're actually tracking the disease burden, uh, MRD and response to therapy by doing 
sequential liquid biopsies. The other area is post-surgery prognostication. So stage two colon cancer, should we give adjuvant chemo or not give adjuvant chemo? Today we have uh, availability of liquid biopsy through various commercial labs to see uh, if the patient would benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. In addition, as I said, and I will show in an example later, um, sequential liquid biopsies can help uh, decide on, on change of treatment, identification of new and evolving resistant mutations in the same patient. So at this time, um, it's mainly used for treatment selection based on actionable mutation, but I think in the near future, we will be using liquid biopsies for monitoring recurrence, uh, MRD, and, and uh, changing treatment based on uh, development of resistant mutations. Well, I mentioned this briefly, uh, heterogeneity, what this means essentially is that we also now realize that uh, they can be both intratumor and intrapatient heterogeneity. So inside the same lesion, you can have different clones of cancer cells. And inside the same patient, you can have different lesions which are genomically different. Now, tissue biopsy may not capture subclonal population of tumor cells with distinct alteration because you can only get a sample from one area. Similarly, tissue biopsy from a single lesion will miss alterations unique to other lesions. So we know that as the cancer progresses, the genomics of the cancer also evolves. And using old tissue or, or biopsy from one area may not accurately represent um, the genomic signature of the tumor that is progressing. And this is where liquid biopsy is beneficial because as the cancer progresses, it sheds DNA into the blood. And when we test this DNA, we can more accurately um, diagnose the resistant mutations. So liquid biopsy, just to summarize, can be considered at the time of initial diagnosis in all patients who need tumor molecular profiling. Now, I would be careful because in my experience, you do have to uh, pay attention. Some patients with uh, cancers which are not widely disseminated have small areas of metastases. They may not shed uh, enough DNA to be captured by liquid biopsy. And sometimes when you do a liquid biopsy, you find um, mutations of unknown significance, which are usually from white cells, et cetera. So you still have to be a bit careful. Liquid biopsy is probably more useful for patients with heavy tumor burden. Um, Clearly, if the patient cannot undergo a biopsy for whatever reason, liquid biopsy is a good option. If the tissue that has been used to make the diagnosis already used up and you don't have any more tissue to do genetic testing, you can consider liquid biopsy. And then now I think we are using more and more liquid biopsy on, on uh, disease progression. Um, okay, so that's a lot of talk. Uh, I thought now I'll show you some real cases of mine. Um, how comprehensive genomic profiling helped in my patient's management. So my first case is a, actually a 65-year-old Indian lady who lives in Singapore. And she was noted to have a high CEA of 60 during a routine annual blood screen. She's a lifelong non-smoker. So based on the CEA uh, elevation, she was referred to see a gastroenterologist and underwent a upper and lower endoscopy, which was actually normal. Um, so the gastroenterologist decided to arrange a CT scan of abdomen and pelvis, which is shown here on the right, which interestingly picked up a uh, left lower lobe lung mass. In addition, I haven't added the photo, but there were multiple enlarged gastrohepatic and retroperitoneal lymph nodes seen. Um, this patient underwent a biopsy of, of uh, a mediastinal lymph node using bronchoscopy and EBUS and was found to have an adenocarcinoma of the lung, most likely advanced stage based on the lymph nodes in the abdomen. Uh, the lab that uh, does the uh, initial, uh, looked at the initial biopsy was asked to do a, a EJFR a molecular test and they uh, were using the IDILA platform, which is a um, uh, PCR-based uh, test. It's very rapid. We can get the result in a day. And this patient had a high pretest probability. She was Asian, non-smoker. So I was quite convinced she probably had the EGFR mutation bust of lung cancer. And, but the IDILA platform was negative, which was quite surprising. And subsequently, single gene testing of ALK and ROS was also negative. 
So uh, I had no choice but to um, uh, start her on on chemotherapy since the three main uh, uh, alterations were negative. Uh, she was PD1 positive, so I added immunotherapy. And this is her uh, IDELA test. As you can see, this is quite recent, June of last year. It was a subcranial lymph node biopsy. And uh, it was uh, deemed as uh, EGFR wild type. There was enough tumor tissue for testing. Luckily, I had more tissue left. So um, while I had to start her on treatment, I wasn't entirely convinced. And I sent uh, another sample uh, for comprehensive genomic profiling using the foundation uh, medicine platform. And this is what the results showed. So um, it, I, it took about three weeks for the result to come. And uh, surprisingly, her tumor had uh, exon 19 deletion, which is uh, uh, the more common EGFR-driven uh, alteration we do see in lung adenocarcinoma. And, and she has the option of, of multiple TKIs. In addition, we also found that she had a high TMB. So somewhere in the future, if she is progresses on TKI, we have the option of giving her immunotherapy. So here clearly there's a case where a, a very good um, PCR-based um, hotspot panel was negative for EGFR mutation. But when I repeated the same sample, I sent it for an NGS test using foundation medicine platform, I found an exon 19 deletion. If I had not done this additional test, I may have continued on chemotherapy, which is obviously inferior to tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy for EGFR mutant lung cancer. The second case I have uh, will detail um, the benefit of liquid biopsy. So um, this is a 49 female who in 2013 was actually diagnosed with a stage three lung cancer and uh, appropriately treated with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Unfortunately, had uh, disease progression subsequently uh, quite soon in multiple areas, including brain, liver, and bone lesions. Uh, we did a PCR-based um, liquid biopsy, confirmed the presence of exon 19 EGFR mutation. And due to the brain mets, uh, we treated the brain mets with radiation and subsequently started on jefitinib. In March of 2015, so about nine, uh, 11 months, predictably, she had disease progression in the liver. So I did a biopsy of the liver and did a PCR test, uh, hoping that she had resistant mutation D790 because by this time we had data with osimertinib, but actually was negative. Uh, again, I wasn't convinced, so I sent a liquid biopsy using NGS, and we found multiple EGFR mutations, including the original mutation and T790, which is what we expect in someone who has progressed after first-generation TKI. Another uh, NGS panel sent at the same time um, confirmed this, but was for for some reason rare uh, for some reason negative for T790. So I started on osimertinib. She had rapid, rapid clinical improvement, except that the liver lesion did not respond. Uh, as, you, as I said before, that uh, PCR-based EGFR testing on the liver lesion did not show T790 mutation. So DNA profiling was done again, and this uh, showed that the T790 clone had come down, but the G724S clone had gone up. So I added a fatnib to osimertinib. Again, repeated the liquid biopsy, and they showed a reduction in the G724S clone with improvement in PET CT. But unfortunately, the liver lesion was still progressing. And again, I repeated the uh, liquid biopsy. It showed worsening in all mutations and a new clone in 797S, which we know does not respond to osimertinib. So I would, this time, no choice. I had to put her on chemotherapy, and she improved clinically. Uh, based on a scan as well as uh, based on the repeat liquid biopsy. But unfortunately, she eventually passed away um, from disease progression and pneumonia. So just to highlight, I did liquid biopsy at multiple time points, and you can see she had different clones in the blood. And as I changed the treatment, some clones increased, decreased, and increased again. TB53, which uh, basically increased towards the end, confirming resistance to all treatment. Um, so this gave me insight uh, into the tumor evolution uh, and why uh, she was responding to a particular therapy at one point 
uh, versus progression at the other point. So I think this where liquid valves is very uh, helpful um, if affordable or available. My third case uh, uh, is on immunotherapy in lung cancer. So this is a 80-year-old. Uh, now she's close to 86, um, 85. Physic uh, a physician, a GP, um, like lifelong non-smoker, presented in uh, January of 2017. Uh, I still remember quite clearly with a persistent non-productive cough and giddiness. Um, she had a workup. She, she was in Penang in Malaysia, uh, mother of one of my colleagues who was working with me in Singapore. So the original scan in Malaysia showed a multiple lesion, in the scan of the brain suggestive of metastasis. So immediately the son flew her to Singapore. We did a PET scan that showed likely a lung primary with multiple metastatic lesions. Uh, we did a biopsy of one of the met metastases in the liver and that uh, showed a TTF1 positive adenocarcinoma. I was convinced this lady had EGFR mutation positive lung cancer because, again, she is non smoker Asian and a TTF1 positive adenocarcinoma. But interestingly, reflect testing for EGFR ALK and ROS was all negative, and the PDL1 TPS score was zero. So, no choice. I had to start her on chemotherapy, but again, I sent her tissue uh, for NGS testing using foundation one, and we obviously treated the brain mets with gamma knife. Uh, fortunately, all of the uh, mets were uh, amenable to gamma knife treatment. So this uh, result came uh, around end of the month. So she had, had the radiation one cycle chemotherapy. And uh, to my surprise, we didn't see EJFR, but we found a BRAF V600 uh, E mutation. Uh, which is not that common, about 1% to 4% of lung adenocarcinoma, it's about half in smokers, half in non-smokers. But what was probably the most interesting finding was a pretty high tumor mutational burden of 29. If you remember, I had mentioned before that in 2018, FDA approved uh, pembrolizumab for all solid tumors um, that had a TMB of more than 10. So this was three times that, that um, cutoff. Um, NGS confirmed that she did not have alteration in EGFR, KRAS, ALK, MET, RET, uh, ERBB2, or ROS1. So now the question was, should I change the chemo, uh, her treatment from chemotherapy to BRAF inhibitor, or should I um, uh, add uh, immunotherapy? Because if you remember, her PDL1 score was zero. So I, initially, I could not use uh, immunotherapy. So this case was actually discussed at Hopkins Molecular Tumor Board because I was uh, working for Johns Hopkins at the time. And they recommended BRAF uh, therapy based on the BRAF mutation, which was considered to be a driver mutation. But BRAF therapy was um, still uh, nascent uh, and quite toxic. Uh, and she is 80 years of age. So I decided to go against the tumor board and, and give her uh, pembrolizumab, which at that time was only approved for second line treatment. And I thought I will keep chemotherapy and uh, BRAF inhibitors for salvage. So just to show you the response, this is the original PET scan in January, which shows um, a couple of lung masses, uh, liver mets, as I mentioned, brain mets and bone mets. And within uh, two or three cycles of immunotherapy, she had a near complete response. This is quite remarkable. <clears throat> as you can see, this is a large liver lesion, which we had biopsied and it's completely gone away. These are the lymph nodes that were causing the cough in the hilar area, all gone. So she had such an um, amazing response that, uh, um, you know, all the cancer went away. The brain met also was normal. Uh, sorry, the brain MRI also became normal. And she was in remission. Um, after two years, I just stopped her pembrolizumab. So that was 2019, somewhere towards the middle of 2019. And till date, we monitor her uh, cancer marker, CEA, which was elevated. It still hasn't gone up. She's in complete remission. It's quite remarkable how effective immunotherapy has been in her treatment. Just to finish on my talk, um, the clinical guidelines, uh, as we all know, mentioned biomarker testing in non-small cell lung cancer, the key recommended tests, and this list keeps on continuing every year, include EJFR, BRAF, KRAS, HER2, MET, HER, uh, this is duplicated, sorry, ALK, ROS, NTURK, RET, um, and the benefit of NGS is that it, it looks at all these mutations, whereas 
uh, the category one and category two tests uh, have to be done one at a time. Uh, so to finish off the key messages from my talk, uh, guidelines recommend broad molecular testing using multi-gene NGS assays if available, at least for lung cancer. I think that is considered to be standard today. Comprehensive genomic profiling uncovers both common and rare driver alterations, potentially undetected by standard of care testing, as I have already shown in some of my examples. And this uh, uh, significantly impacts clinical decision making. Um, so that's where comprehensive genomic profiling is, is beneficial, not just for targeted therapy, as well as immunotherapy and clinical trials, if these are available in your country. Liquid biopsy is an alternative um, using uh, either NGS again or PCR-based tests, uh, easy to take a sample. But again, you have to be a bit careful uh, how, uh, how to select the patient best for liquid biopsy. And I think more and more we are using it for monitoring treatment response and disease progression as I highlighted in the second case. I think that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. A long talk, but I'd love to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Akhil Chopra, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, and uh, we're having a lot of questions, questions from our young oncologists in our country. Should I start the question and answer sessions? Yes, please. Ready? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the first uh, question is from Dr. Arman Reza. It is possible to do LK translocation test from liquid biopsy? Yes, if you do a liquid uh, biopsy using an NGS platform, it will look at, uh, it will detect L translocations. That's correct. In fact, it will also tell you the exact gene that is translocated. Um, because uh, IHC and FISH may not tell you those details, but a liquid biopsy can even tell you what is the gene that is translocated because that can become relevant, especially after progression on first generation alkinibitors such as crizotinib, um, uh, so and brigatinib. And we know that certain L translocations respond to uh, drugs like alkinib, whereas certain do not. Uh, they only respond to lorlatinib and so on and so forth. So yes, for sure. Uh, thank you, sir. And another question from Dr. Arifu Rahman regarding liquid biopsy. What is the appropriate time of liquid biopsy if a patient is on TKI or CHT and why? If the patient is on, sorry? TKI. Or chemotherapy. Uh, TKI, yeah, or chemotherapy, okay. Yeah, so I mean, if the patient is responding uh, to your treatment, you don't need to do a liquid biopsy. Um, I think I do liquid biopsy when the patients are progressing. Um, so if their scan shows worsening of disease and I want to see the reason the progression is there, what is the resistance mechanism? But I want to um, just caution uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, that um, in my experience, if the progression is not, widespread, meaning let's say there are two or three lesions in the lung and one lesion in the bone or in the liver, and there is slight increase in size and FTG uptake or just a slight increase in size, you may not get a um, uh, positive liquid biopsy um, because there's not enough DNA shed. So this only comes, unfortunately, with experience. I usually use my liquid biopsy when there's obvious uh, disseminated widespread metastases, or if there's a lot of bone mets, because if there are a lot of bone mets, there's likely increased likelihood that the DNA will be shed into the blood. Uh, so in this regard, uh, I have the, another question uh, for the same uh, scenario. You were saying that if it is a, a few metastatic uh, things, and should we continue the same TKI for, 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 the, for the duration challenge, re-challenge? So that's a great question. A, a bit, uh, I, I, we talk about treatment in my second talk, but so what we have realized over the last uh, about eight, nine years is that especially in patients who you have treated, who have EGFR-driven cancers and are on TKI, you may see oligometastatic progression. What that means is you, you put them on a TKI, they're doing great for nine months, 10 months, and you repeat the cancer marker goes up, you repeat the scan, and you find that one or two lesions are bigger, the rest are under control. 
So we call this oligomeristic progression. So what we are doing here, uh, fortunately, since we have access to to a lot of good radiation doctors, we do SBRT or local therapy for these lesions. And, and clearly, you get another few months of benefit from the same TKI without having to change treatment. And this has also now been shown in multiple clinical trials. So my answer to your question is, yeah, if there's a one or two areas, um, you could either continue the same TKI if there is uh, no impending visceral crisis. You can do SBRT to these lesions. Um, in some situations, I've even added chemotherapy for a few months, got it under control, then taken the chemotherapy off. But eventually, this obviously strategy fails, and you do a liquid biopsy, see why is the resistance there, do we need to change the drug, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Sir, the last question regarding your answer. During SBRT, should we continue the same TK, or we should stop uh, conventional radiation or uh, SBRT? The TK is stopped or not? Yeah, so great question. Not a lot of data available. What I do in my practice is I just hold off the TKI for two days before SBRT and two days after I, I started. Thank you, sir. I have the same, same, same thought. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shogil. Uh, Dr. Rokunu Zaman has the, another question about uh, liquid biopsy. What are the limitations of liquid biopsy? Yeah, so the main limitation, what I mentioned, that sometimes there's a false negative. If you use it in a patient who doesn't have a lot of tumor uh, cancer burden, um, you may not detect. The second is finding mutations um, called chip mutations, which are not related to the cancer. So quite commonly, if you know, it's an elderly gentleman or a female, you do a liquid biopsy, you'll find a P53 mutation. And that may actually be from the white cell uh, DNA, not from the cancer. Uh, so this also initially uh, took me some time to understand this. Uh, and this is a well-described phenomenon now. So those are the probably the limitations uh, liquid biopsy has. Then, of course, the platform that is used, you know, are you using a droplet uh, digital PCR-based platform, NGS platform, and so on and so forth. NGS platforms are obviously more comprehensive, more reliable. And the new NGS platforms are even giving you a blood tumor mutational burden, which can also help decide whether immunotherapy will be an option for these patients. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Anjun Dash has a question. What is the percentage of PDL1 expression needed for immunotherapy? <laughs> Yeah, so I think they may be, um, uh, Dr. Das, right? Maybe referring to my uh, example. Uh, so if, if you recollect the evolution of immunotherapy in lung cancer, initially approved in second line setting, then bought to, to first line setting. Um, so if you have more than 50% PDL1 positive TPS, you can give single agent immunotherapy. If zero to 50%, um, combination with uh, chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So really, uh, for my practice, I even if the PDL1 is zero, uh, if there are no targetable alterations, no actionable mutations, I would add immunotherapy. Uh, probably the benefit will not be as much as if there's PDL1 positive tumor, and I will explain that to the patient. Now, I also want to make a point that PDL1 testing has also evolved over time. It depends on which antibody you're testing, how good your lab is, how good the sample is. So sometimes uh, you may consider repeating the PDL on test from another lab. Or if you have the access to NGS, that gives you TMB, which is tumor mutation button. That also can be used to make that determination. If the patient has a very low TMB and PDL on is zero, the benefit from immunotherapy is probably not going to be much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Dr. Yusuf Ali had a question. Will multiple targeted drugs be used if multiple actionable drivers are positive? Yeah, it's a great question. Luckily, it doesn't happen uh, quite often. Most of the driver mutations are ex mutually exclusive. But I have one patient who had been on osimertinib for almost uh, two years, progressed, and I did a liquid biopsy on progression and was found to have a uh, met exon 14 skipping mutation, which is not common. So um, I combined, I didn't stop osimertinib, I added a, a MET inhibitor, which we had just um, uh, got in Singapore, and actually the patient responded. So uh, if there are, well, I'd, I'd never seen more than two, but if there are two uh, mutations, both which are actionable, 
and you have drugs against both, it's reasonable to try combination, but you have to be careful because some of these drugs have overlapping toxicities. And of course, the cost can be considerable. Again, fortunately, this is not a common situation. Most often, these driver mutations are mutually exclusive. Uh, Professor Yusuf Ali had another query. Will you suggest molecular study for non-metastatic cancer, especially in locally advanced adenocarcinomas? Yeah, great question. And the answer is yes. We have been doing it since the uh, results of the ADORA trial. So as you know, the ADORA trial was a trial that looked at adjuvant osimertinib in uh, stage uh, 1, 2, and 3 lung cancer. And uh, those patients who had EGFR-positive disease benefited from use of adjuvant osimertinib for two years after chemotherapy. Uh, for stage three, uh, unresectable lung cancer, a little more complicated because uh, uh, those cancers are usually treated with chemo and radiation concurrent. Uh, there is data from Pacific trial, um, which is showing the benefit of um, uh, durvalumab for one year after chemo radiation adjuvant setting. The dilemma comes when if you have a stage three lung cancer, which is EJFR mutant positive, and you have given chemo radiation. Should you give dorvalumab or should you give TKI? So what I believe, my interpretation of the Pacific trial is that the subset, there were very few EGFR mutant positive patients. So I feel that uh, this subset probably does not benefit on adjuvant immunotherapy. I put these patients on adjuvant TKI as an extrapolation of the ADORA trial. So I hope I answered that question. Yes, before we didn't do EGFR testing or molecular testing for locally advanced or early lung cancers, but now with the adjuvant data coming in, at least for the EGFR mutation form, we don't have that for ALK or ROS, but at least EGFR mutant, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it affects their, uh, their management. So I am doing that. So, uh, we have a case. Uh, uh, from Dr. Mahmoud, uh, some young patients, um, non-smoker with no family history, presents with aggressive lung cancer at the age of 20 to 30 years. What is the genetic profile and major alteration in such cases? Can the genetic test be used in case of lung cancer screening? Uh, the patient is all already diagnosed with lung cancer, right? So, I mean, so screening is for those who are don't have lung cancer, but I assume uh, the, my colleague is concerned, why does this uh, young man at 20 have advanced and aggressive lung cancer? Could it be a hereditary lung cancer? I assume that is his question. So, so yes, uh, if, if you have a young person with any cancer and you don't have a good um, explanation, there is a role for hereditary genetic testing. Um, of course, the uh, important is to get a family history to see if there are any other cancers. So there is hereditary genetic testing, and then there is testing for somatic mutations for decision-making. They are different. Both can be done for this particular patient. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Jahangir Alam, uh, he has a query. Is there any role of TKI or new adjuvant chemotherapy or right on adjuvant setting? Sorry. Can you I repeat that? Uh, that's oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What is the role of EGFR mutation? Yeah. So, so we just discussed this. So based on the ADORA trial uh, in patients with uh, stage 2, stage 3, and I think stage 1B patients or small subset also included, uh, there is a clear benefit of um, adjuvant TKI uh, as osimertinib for two years in reducing uh, disease recurrence and improving disease-free survival. Okay, and uh, uh, another question from Dr. Ruxana Rayhan. Uh, she's uh, asking about, would you suggest cancer panel testing in PCR platform yes. other than individual testing in different platforms? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Dr. Ryan, for that question. So as I said, um, you know, NGS testing, one, uh, one uh, problem we still have is the cost. Even though the cost has substantially come down, it's still um, uh, not cheap. In Singapore, fortunately, for our patients who have insurance coverage, the insurance covers it, but we do have a lot of patients who don't have full insurance coverage and they have to pay out of pocket. So I think the single uh, uh, gene molecular tests uh, are still very important. Uh, it's still better to do some 
type of uh, molecular testing, whether we are using PCR um, or hotspot, um, you know, over doing no test at all. So if your particular institution has a PCR platform for EGFR, IHC platform for ALK, IHC for um, PDL1, uh, fish for ROS, please, by all means, uh, do the testing. Just be careful that you need adequate amount of tissue because each test requires uh, tissue uh, and additional slides. Doctor, I need to interrupt. This is Dr. Ruxana Raihan. So I am Hi. to start NGS platform in Asania Mission Cancer Hospital with support of Professor Kamuzaman. So yeah, to start it, it takes some time. My question basically is, till the time we start NGS, is it possible, I mean, how beneficial it is to go, I mean, there are some commercial um, lung cancer panel kits and other uh, cancer panel kits for PCR available as well. So how would you suggest them over individual panel, I mean, individual testing in different platforms like IHC or PISH or PCR? Together, can we, do you suggest together we can go for this panel testing through PCR? Of course. So I think you are referring to these commercially available lung mm -hmm. cancer panels using PCR yeah, exactly. testing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, as I said, if you, if you are still setting up your NGS in the meantime, these panels are quite good. You know, some of the panels, even we have, we use sometimes because they are cheaper than NGS. Uh, 50 gene panels. Um, exactly. Yeah. So I definitely think, as I said, it's definitely better than not testing. It's definitely better than single gene testing because these also require uh, uh, one uh, tissue block or slides.